Welcome to A Theory of Everything. My name is Luis Razo, the director of the European Institute of Science and Management. Today I'm going to give a quick overview of theoretical physics for dummies. Don't be fooled by the word dummies though, because whether you're a 14-year-old activist or have a PhD in physics, there's an important lesson here. We're going to proceed according to the famous adage that if you can't describe something simply, it's because you don't understand it well enough. Clarity in physics is especially relevant and needed at the moment, given that a global pandemic has just exposed the weaknesses of the world's infrastructure, and yet the physics community, which is disproportionately responsible for the technical foundations of the modern world, has had nothing meaningful to say about it. As a matter of fact, in the midst of the chaos, a couple of prominent people have proposed competing theories of everything but neither proposal has brought the world any more clarity. For those who don't remember, a theory of everything is an attempt to unify general relativity and quantum mechanics, which is arguably the most important open question in all of science. In this podcast, we're going to review several proposed theories of everything, and I'll end by pointing you to one that stands head and shoulders above the rest in terms of the most important criteria. Before we start, let's agree to establish as a first principle the idea that it would be better for humanity to survive than it would for humanity to go extinct. The reason I need to make this explicit from the beginning will be evident soon. With that as a first principle, let's start with two simple analogies. Imagine a plane crash in Siberia with several survivors. If they don't get help soon, they're probably going to die. One of the survivors is disoriented and keeps repeating that the wings of the plane are beautiful. Another equally disoriented survivor keeps insisting, we've crashed because of the engine. A third survivor observes, we've crashed near a forest. Finally, a fourth person says, my mobile phone is still working. I'm gonna use it to call for help. In a very crude way, the current situation in theoretical physics is like this plane crash. As a species, we're on the verge of potential extinction and physicists are obsessing over things that may or may not be correct, but even if they are correct, have little or no bearing on human survival. A second analogy I want to make involves the parable of the blind men and the elephant. In the parable, each man feels a different part of the elephant's body. So one of them describes a snake, another describes a wall, and another describes a tree trunk. All of the descriptions are accurate, but none of them are accurate enough to capture the full reality of the elephant. Once again, I'm going to argue that this is analogous to what's happening in theoretical physics. Each of the proposals we're going to review describes the same underlying reality from a different perspective, but only one of them captures the elephant as a whole. The key concepts here are interpretation and goals. Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman understood interpretation and goals to be fundamental in physics. And it's worth listening to him again. Suppose you have two theories, A and B, which look completely different psychologically, different ideas in them and so on. But that all the consequences that are computed, all the consequences that are computed are exactly the same. Suppose we have two such theories, how are we going to decide which one is right? No way, not by science. However, for psychological reasons, in order to get new theories, these two things are very far from equivalent. Because one gives a man different ideas than the other. By putting the theory in a certain kind of framework, you get an idea what to change. And every theoretical physicist that's any good knows six or seven different theoretical representations for exactly the same physics. And our knows that the two, that they're all equivalent, but he keeps them in his head hoping that they'll give him different ideas for guessing. Feynman is saying that interpretation can make the difference between a dead end and a breakthrough in physics. The same principle applies to theories of everything, of course, and to our ultimate goal of long-term human survival. So with all of this in mind, let's quickly review some of the strongest candidates for a theory of everything. As we explained in our inaugural lecture, in terms of its impact on other areas of physics and math, 
String theory is the most promising candidate for a theory of everything. It has problems, however. It requires extra dimensions. It implies that we live in a holographic universe and it's untestable. On top of that, it has nothing meaningful to say about anything that really matters to humans. Here's a symbolic example of how one prominent string theorist, Eric Verlinde, sees the potential value of string theory. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here and to be telling you this evening about what I think are exciting developments in theoretical physics. Then you may ask, what is it good for? As you can see, Verlin is good humored about the apparent lack of utility in string theory, but other physicists are more sensitive about it, and many of them exhibit open scorn when they're asked to connect their work to long-term human survival. Loop quantum gravity is string theory's greatest mainstream rival, and the situation in this smaller domain is exactly the same. There's lots of math, but very little sense-making. String theory and loop quantum gravity are like the two disoriented people in our opening plane crash who aren't registering the urgency of the modern human predicament. Apart from string theory and loop quantum gravity, there are a number of unconventional theories of everything that are being proposed. Each of them has serious shortcomings, but we're going to assume, like the elephant parable that we opened with, that they all contain elements of truth. Let's quickly review them. Stephen Wolfram, who got his PhD in physics from MIT at the age of 20, but left academia to go into business, recently proposed what he refers to as a computational theory of everything. Here's how he describes it. Very simple rule. We don't know what the actual rule is, but a rule a bit like this, and it's just applying it over and over and over again, trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of times to include everything that we now know exists in the universe. Let's assume that Wolfram is right. What's more relevant for our purposes is the fact that Wolfram at least attempts to connect his proposed theory of everything to human goals. In fact, on his blog, he discusses the need for a new constitution based on artificial intelligence. He doesn't get very specific, however, and implicitly rejects the idea of computationally setting long-term human survival as a primary goal. He writes, we can't define an ultimate purpose. There won't be a simple artificial intelligence principle that encapsulates our goals in a constitution. By analogy, Wolfram is like the person in the plane crash who's obsessing over the engine failure and not focusing on the rescue. He knows the rescue is important, but he doesn't have anything concrete to say about it, so he sticks to the engine. Another proposed theory of everything, as we saw in a previous post, comes from Eric Weinstein, the mathematical physicist godfather of the intellectual dark web. He describes his proposal as geometric unity, which centers around a 14-dimensional observers. Here's the essence of the idea. You get very large spinorial objects upstairs on this 14-dimensional world, Y14, which is part of the observers. When you pull that information back from Y14 down to X4, the 14-dimensional world looks like a four-dimensional world plus a 10-dimensional complement. That 10-dimensional complement, which is called a normal bundle, that look like the things that give our, per our particles personality. Notice the broad conceptual similarity between what Weinstein is proposing and what string theory proposes which are multiple dimensions, emergence, and some sort of holography. Remember the elephant parable where two people are describing the same animal from a different perspective? It's very likely that at least some of that is happening here. More important for our purpose, however, is what Weinstein concludes from his proposal, which is this. We have to leave this planet? That's an extreme conclusion that may be out of reach for a long time to come but at least Weinstein understands the absolute priority of human survival. In our plane crash analogy, Weinstein isn't the disoriented person obsessing over the plane's engine, nor is he the person with a clear head using his phone to call for help. He's somewhere in between these two. 
Another proposal to unify physics is known as an exceptionally simple theory of everything. It's being proposed by a renegade surfer physicist named Garrett Lisi. His proposal is based on something known as the E8 Lie group in mathematics. Here's how Lisi describes it. After banging my head against the problem for almost a decade, I managed to find finally an answer. What is this geometric description of elementary particles? And it turns out that there are these uh, very beautiful, intricately uh, uh, intertwined and complex mathematical structures called Lie groups. And the structure of some of these Lie groups, which are exceptional cases among Lie groups, turn out to correspond to exactly the properties of electrons and other elementary matter particles also intertwined with gravity and all the other forces. So what are the implications of Lisi's proposal? Tellingly, he doesn't foresee any. For him, it would be enough to know that the fundamental structure of the universe is incredibly beautiful. As I proposed from the beginning, however, we must judge ideas by whether they lead us toward or away from extinction. A theory of everything that has nothing to say about human survival is obviously not as valuable as a theory of everything that can improve our prospects of survival. In terms of our plane crash analogy, Lisi is a person who's obsessing over the beauty of the plane's wings. There's nothing wrong with that, but we need to concentrate on the goal, which is long-term human survival. Physics is hard, and learning new models is time-consuming, which is why a proposal that claims to connect physics to long-term human survival should be more attractive to us on its face than a proposal that fails to do so, as long as the proposal follows standard scientific protocol. With this in mind, I'm going to close by inviting you to spend some time with a theory of everything that not only reconciles quantum mechanics with general relativity, but is also testable and yields a concrete social choice mechanism designed to maximize human existence. The proposal is based on something that one of the most renowned physicists in the world, Juan Maldacena, refers to as the principle of maximal life. Here's how he describes it. So there is a principle in physics that says that any elementary particle tries to travel in a way that maximizes its own proper time. So the time it experiences is as long as uh, possible. Um, so that's uh, the principle of maximal life or maximal experience time. Our proposal is founded on the principle of maximal life and on 500 years of well-established mainstream physics. But it's simple enough for a child to understand. Most important of all, however, our proposal gives rise to a concrete social choice mechanism designed to maximize long-term human survival. If you're interested, I'll put a link to the pertinent lecture in the video description, or you can visit our website to get a copy of the book. Thanks for your time. If you like what you heard, stick around and let's reason together.